I mean, partly what psychotherapy or personality development seems to be about is the continual integration of the personality so that the, the person's, the psyche isn't at odds with itself and it can move forward with a minimum of conflict. That's something related to the Piagetian idea of an equilibrated state. So if you're in an equilibrated state, you don't have the sense that there are parts of you warring against other parts because you've been able to weave everything together into a coherent identity that covers the past and the present and the future. So the first stage in Jung's vision of what constituted higher development was the union of, the, of rationality with emotion and motivation. And he saw that that was symbolized in the literature that he had reviewed by masculine spirit, feminine emotions, and and motivation, bang, together in one thing. So that then would be the united mind and spirit in a sense. And then the next stage, which was symbolized again by the masculine feminine symbolism, it was the uni united mind, spirit with the body. And so what that would mean is that once you got your act together, so to speak, you would implement it in your behavior so that there was no contradictions between who you were in terms of how you thought and how you felt and what you wanted and what you were actually doing. And modern philosophers have described what they call a performative contradiction, which they've formally described as a, another type of, of lie, essentially, another type of deceit, which is that you say one thing and do another. And, it, it, and it's interesting because it's not, it's not a logical it's not a, a form of logical deceit in a sense because your conceptualizations are abstract and your behavior is concrete, but there can still be a contradiction between the two, especially when you start to understand that most of what your psyche is representing are schema for action rather than for representation. So the point is, is that once your emotions and your motivations are working alongside your rational mind, really that your rational mind is properly nested within them, because that's, that's a much more accurate way of looking at it, then the next thing you should do is act consistently in accordance with who you are. So that's stage two. Both of those stages are pretty easy to understand. But the third stage is actually a phenomenological stage. You have to think phenomenologically to understand it. So here's, here's one way of thinking about it. So imagine that you go home and let's say you've set up a room and uh, in that room it's not a very nice room you know maybe you've got some posters on the wall and they're sort of hanging a little cockeyed and you know there's dust bunnies are mating underneath the bed and um, you have piles of paperwork that you haven't done and you know homework and you know maybe there's the odd crust of bread or so forth lying about and when you walk in there It's you in the room. That's one way of thinking about it. But another way of thinking about it is that when you walk in there, you are the room. Just like you're the room when you're here. Because the room makes up a part of what you're experiencing. And the phenomenologist would say, in a sense, that the best way to conceptualize the self in its totality is what you experience. Like everything that you experience is you. And so what that would mean is that there's no difference between putting the posters up on your wall properly and cleaning underneath the bed and maybe making it and finishing your homework and putting the room in order so that you feel confident and calm there and maybe so that you even enjoy being there or maybe even so that it's beautiful there. There's no difference between that and fixing up your own personality. So then you could say, here's another way of looking at it. And I, I do, this, I believe that this is a very profound way of looking at things. So then imagine that you could extend that view. But it's kind of easy to understand when you think about it as your own room, because you're in there quite a lot. And so maybe, let's say you're in your room 10% of the day. So we could say that the experiences that characterize your room are 10% of you, at least for the time being, and that you can have a low quality experience in there or a high quality experience in there. Um, then let's say that you start generalizing that to the whole house, you know, so then you can start thinking, well, 
Are there problematic places in the house? Are there problematic relationships among the people in the house? And those problematic relationships are also you. And you can tell when there's a problem because you encounter undesired negative emotion in, a, in relationship to some relationship or in some physical locale within the house. And maybe you could fix that, you know, little incremental bit by incremental bit. You could work on that. You could note that the negative emotion that you don't want to have arise signifies something. It signifies that that situation in some sense is non-optimal. And then you could work on strategies to optimize that. And you don't do that till you stop making the presupposition that there's you and then there's the house. It's like, well, the distinction between you and where you are is a very unclear distinction. So then let's say you're walking down the street or you're going into a store and maybe your manners aren't as good as they could be. Because, you know, to be really socially sophisticated is a real art. You can learn, it can take you decades to learn how to do that properly. And people who are really, really socially skilled have a much, a much higher quality existence because no matter where they go, they immediately establish a relationship with the people that they're talking to. And then it's not an impersonal and, and dead or aggravating interaction. So, you know, maybe they'll walk into a store and the first thing they do if someone comes up and helps them is they look at the person and, you know, ask them how they're doing and, you know, how their day has been and they make a little relationship and, you know, the person is kind of happy about that because it sort of pops them out of their persona role and then they can have a little discussion about what they're doing in the store and what they want and then all of a sudden it's a high quality experience and that person, everywhere they go, if they're skilled like that, so they're awake and they're attentive and they're listening, everywhere they go they can have a high quality interaction. You know, and people who learn how to do that, learn to do it partly by noticing when they're in an interaction with someone or somewhere, that if it isn't going in an optimal manner, or if it's producing undesired negative emotion, then there's something wrong with the way that they're being in that situation. And they pay attention to that and see if they can figure out how to modify it. A lot of it is attention and listening which is their key component, say, to Rogerian psychotherapy, is atten attention and listening. So, you might say, well, so, so you, you can go into your room and you can identify little problems that are in your room that you could fix, that maybe you would fix, and so then you could start fixing them, and that improves the quality of that particular environment, and then you could start to generalize beyond, you know, the locales that are more specifically under your control, because if, if you're walking down Bloor, for example, and you go into a store and you talk to a clerk, well, the probability is pretty high that the clerk is at least reasonably functional, so you should be able to get beyond their barriers, in a sense, and have a genuine interaction with them without too much difficulty. But then maybe you're wandering down Bloor and you run across someone who's schizophrenic and maybe alcoholic at the same time, and, well, that's a part of your experience that might supersede your ability to transform, right? The, the phenomenologists and, and people like Rogers aren't making the claim that you should be able to solve every problem that you come across or even that you should try because there'll be things that you experience that are so complex and problematic that you might make them worse if you fiddle around with them, you know. You gotta be very careful not to extend yourself dramatically beyond your skill level. But you can certainly start in isolated locales. And if you stop presuming a priori that there's some radical distinction between you and the environment that you happen to be in, because it's all your experience, if you stop making that subject-object distinction, which is one of the things the phenomenologists really objected to, because they concentrated on being as such, which was sort of lived experience as the ground of reality, rather than the objective world is the ground of reality. If you, if, you, if you allow yourself to step outside that dichotomy and you start to understand that wherever you go, including the places that you're in a lot, that there's no distinction between fixing up those places when you notice that there's something wrong with them and you could fix them up and, and fixing yourself up, it's, it, it opens up a whole new avenue to 
getting your life together. Because, you know, people always think they have to work on themselves. It's like, it's not, this is one of the things that the psychoanalysts, I think, didn't get quite right, although Jung touched on it in his later work. It's, there's not, all of you isn't inside your head. And for the psychoanalysts, a lot of what the, the work that you were doing on yourself was on, your un, on the relationship, say, between your conscious and your unconscious mind, but a tremendous amount of that was sort of inside your skull, so to speak. But the phenomenologists, the phenomenological approach enables you to start reconceptualizing the psyche if, as something that extends beyond you and, and always will, and so that you can work on its reconstruction at any level of analysis where your own nervous system is signaling to you that there's a problem. 